So thank you, Robin and, and Cody. It's a homecoming in more ways than one, because I, I feel that way about these conferences. I, there's something very special about them, uh, the way Robin and Cody and the staff create a feeling of homecoming. And um, after I've uh, disavowed the title of the series, I've come to enjoy the, the feeling and the warmth and the closeness that of, it is like family here. But for me, it's, it's a homecoming in another sense, too, because I not only grew up in New York City, but I grew up in the shadow of this building, about three blocks north of here. Uh, and uh, always there was this cathedral, which when I was a child was under construction, which is still under construction. And uh, there's something sort of reassuring about that, that uh, some things don't change at all. Just tell you what um, we're going to do in the next uh, hour or so, because you never know in these conferences exactly what you're going to do, but uh, what I've written down to do. Um, I'm going to give a kind of statement of uh, the journey that I've come to, to the place where I arrived at the focus of the title, which is the need for a sacred science that can look at phenomena such as the alien, so-called alien abduction experience or near-death experiences, and which can have the kind of reliability that the scientific method has achieved in relation to the physical world. And then I'm going to ask Veronica Goodchild, who some of you may who are sitting here, some of you may remember. Uh, from Palm Springs, um, and I'll uh, say a little bit more about uh, where Veronica and I, our association, how, how, what I have in mind in having her um, speak with me. Um, in case I forget, I want to say a little bit about our, just a word about our center. Um, most of you think of the Center in relation to PEER, a program for extraordinary experience research, but PEER is a program of the Center for Psychology and Social Change. And we are going through a kind of rebirth in our center through our new director, Don McDermott, who is here and some of you will get to meet. And we have a number of other programs that are evolving that grow out of the transformation of consciousness, but express themselves in relation to conflict, violence, and especially uh, the environmental crisis that we're uh, now uh, experiencing. Uh, we wake up every morning to a another piece of that crisis. I'm indebted to uh, a writer, a um, extraordinary scholar by the name of Syed. Hossein Nasser, who has focused on this whole question of sacred science and the need for a sacred science. One of his books has that title. Um, he's an Islamic scholar he's at George Washington University, and he has been uh, writing more eloquently than anyone uh, I know about the epistemology of the sacred and the need to develop and return to ways of knowing uh, that bring us to a much more expanded, profound uh, panorama awareness of, of reality. Uh, and uh, I'll have a little bit uh, further to say uh, about him uh, toward the end. Now, what happened with me is that I, as most of you know, began about 12 years ago to work with people who'd had these so-called abduction experiences, encounters with strange beings. And I was at first incredulous and then astounded and then excited about what I was finding. And I figured if I went out there and wrote about that and talked about that, everybody would, who could listen, 
intelligent or not really uh, could would find it equally exciting and find that this is really important and that we were in a relationship with beings from another dimension or whatever it was but that wasn't the response that I received um, I found a lot of people got very upset about this and uh, began to wonder uh, why somebody who was a, a more or less respected Harvard professor would embark on such a strange and disturbing journey, just dis a disturbed journey that, that, that it was, and the focus became upon me and what was wrong with me that I should even take such things seriously. And of course, in the psychiatric community, there's no shortage of diagnoses for people like me. Uh, the notion of a midlife crisis was extended into the late 60s, and uh, which I found, you know, sort of curiously satisfying in a way. But, um, but the the fact is that uh, this ran into a, a kind of buzzsaw in the media and at Harvard, so much so that an, a committee was appointed, a three-person committee to investigate. Uh, there were vague hints uh, of a kind of Kafka-like uh, nature that uh, questions had been raised about my methods and I was thoroughly investigated for 15 months and the dean when he presented to me the letter um, telling me that this committee had been formed said, John, you wouldn't be in, because we had been friends, you wouldn't be in trouble if you just said you discovered a new psychiatric syndrome uh, whose cause was unknown. It's when you said that this work required that perhaps we reconsider the nature of reality. That's what got you into trouble. So I've thought a lot about that. And one of the recommendations of the committee was that I should involve more colleagues. Well, I had a lot of trouble doing that in the early years because they dismissed this out of hand and looked at wanted to be as far away from me as, as possible. But finally, uh, with the help of uh, Karen Wazilowski, who's here, and others in our program, we had a conference at Harvard, not sponsored by Harvard, but at, uh, two years ago at the Harvard Divinity School, in which we brought people together from many different fields to look at how do we think about, how do we study anomalous phenomena like this. And what emerged, among many things, from this meeting was that we lacked a reliable science of human experience, and especially of experiences, however powerful or important, that challenged the prevailing worldview. So I've begun to think about that a great deal. Now, Rather than sort of take on the scientific method, which uh, is pretty popular these days, uh, I've been more interested in why is it, what does it offer that has been so extraordinarily successful? Um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Bill Gibson, is a playwright who wrote uh, Two for the Seesaw and Miracle Workers, a, a friend, and he was raised as a Roman Catholic and very quite strict. and. Uh, he sort of left that, became very secular, and then he kind of wandered back occasionally into the church. You know? And he said when he goes into the church, he told me this, when he goes into the church, his consciousness seems to open up and he feels connected with the divine, with beings that extend beyond this world, and it's an incredible experience. And then when he comes out of the church, he goes back to saying, this is reality, the material world around me, and he dismisses all that. So I asked him, I said, well, Bill, why do you favor the worldview that you return to when you come out of the church over the one that you experience in the church? And he said that science, the material science, Newtonian, Cartesian science, whatever you want to call it, has been so successful in giving us a blueprint, a map of the world. And so I argue with him, of course, and I say, well, what about all these other dimensions and this and that? He says, but there's no reliable way of knowing what's true in those other dimensions. Anything seems to go. 
So I, I thought about that. And I raised, I began to think about how do we decide when somebody's reporting to us profound, powerful human experiences, or potentially so, how do we decide what to believe? This is one of the reasons that channeling is such a problem. Some channeling, channeled information is tremendously important and the channelers, people of great integrity, but anybody can sort of hang out a shingle and say they're channeling this or that entity or God figure and uh, the universe is just as full of misinformation out there as it is in Washington. So I, I, uh, so the, that, that question began to really, uh, I began to wrestle with that a lot. And it's also, uh, as for example in the so-called alien abduction matter, the stakes are very high. We're, we're dealing with something which so fundamentally challenges the Western worldview as those of us that claim to be or offering information that might do that are being held to very tough standards and properly so because the scientific method, whatever its limitations has been, has developed very clear standards of experimentation, testing, rational analysis, replicability and so forth. And we don't have that. And we can't have that. But what can we have? Well, we're dependent on the reports. Not entirely. There is physical evidence. Uh, we People, for example, abductees do have marks on their bodies. Uh, um, there's missing time, although it's hard to objectify that. Uh, Veronica will be saying a little bit about that. But the physical evidence is kind of like if you were trying to study a giant and all that you got was the toenail of the giant. You know, I even like the image of it because it's sort of curved like a spaceship, you know. The, that, and you study that toenail and you think you're, you spend, you measure it and you get how many toenails have you seen and how many people have seen it and this and that and you conclude this is what the, this is what it's about. But you don't see the toe. You don't see the rest of the body. You don't see the giant that's there. You miss knowing. So, but how do you know the giant of the reality beyond? You know through consciousness, through your whole self, but how do you know what, what's reliable? And I don't have the answer to this. I just can keep asking this question and addressing it. In part, it's a clinical question because it involves the reliability of the people who are making the reports. And one of the things that allowed me to endure through this whole Harvard Inquisition period was that I could keep saying, look, you see these people, you talk to them, do they seem like they're suffering from some kind of mental condition? And those that were, you know, sometimes people just refuse to see them, but those who were willing to come in the room with me said, would come out shaking their heads and say, I see what you mean, I, I don't understand this either. And I keep saying, Nothing in my 40, because it's now more than 40 years of experience as a clinician, has given me one bit of information that helps me understand what I'm hearing psychiatrically. The people are talking to me about experiences with emotion that's appropriate to what they're talking about, appropriate questioning, they have solid lives otherwise, there's nothing to suggest delusion. The only problem the only problem is that what they're talking about is not considered possible from the standpoint of the worldview in which they and I were raised. Now, I happen to make the choice of deciding that something wrong with the worldview rather than that if we just keep going down that same road, we're going to find a syndrome that's going to explain this. But that's, once you go down the road of challenging the worldview, things really begin to get interesting. The people's stories were consistent, one from another. They, they would vary some. Some were more uh, traumatic. Some were more in, uh, opening up to experiences of the divine. But by and large, there was a consistent pattern of, of, of the stories. And they were reported with, with feeling that I could uh, feel was, that I could determine was based on what sounded like something that had really happened to them. And the, the intensity of the feeling, the, um, as I mentioned, the self-doubt, 
the clinical soundness of these individuals, all of this I could speak about. But there was something more. Because I even even that I say, look, I'd argue, I'd present everybody do psychological tests, you find out that you know there's no pathology that it can explain it. We have done studies at peer of that nature. And a psychiatric a psychiatric analyses don't reveal anything that's particularly helpful or doesn't add anything to it. But even those arguments don't get anywhere or don't get very far because there's something missing in this question of what is reliable. And I, I came upon the notion of the of the witness. Now, this came because in San Marino in April 1999, I was at a conference, and at that conference was a Catholic prelate wearing a cassock, and he said, uh, he, uh, he was talking about the UFO and abduction phenomenon, he said, I, and he was not speaking for the Vatican, but clearly what he had said was not offensive to the Vatican, he said, I take this very, very seriously, why? because there are so many reliable witnesses, apparently reliable witnesses. And in the church, when we're trying to evaluate miracles, determine what miracles to believe, we have to depend on witnesses. Now, what is a reliable witness? Well, they go through much of what we do. They have, currently they've been using uh, psychiatric and psychological examinations of people reporting miracles. But there is something about the witness with a capital W that, ha that is in a sacred tradition. Not just in the Catholic Church. I talked with a Zen master about this. and they, he, he says that there's, there's a, a way that you experience somebody who has a clarity of mind, does not have another agenda, is not attached to what they're saying. There's a purity of the way they express it. You, you, you experience what they're talking about as if it were happening to yourself. They, they convey to you something that you, you just are part of the experience. It's as, and, and one of the people that I work with, an experiencer, said it, it's as if they, they come and, and they've, they've been touched by God. You, you, you feel that, that there's that connection that they express and, and represent. So, I began then to reinterpret my own job, since I'm not a direct witness in the sense of having uh, had these experiences with beings or um, been taken or whatever happens to people uh, when they uh, encounter this phenomenon. Uh, I began to look upon myself as a kind of witness to the witnesses, uh, somebody that helps give them voice or asserts their reliability. because. Whatever the, the notion of somebody in my position, quote unquote, and that, that's a, in an archetypal sense, is, has a chance, even though it gets shot at a lot, a chance to be heard or to enable other people to be heard. So there is this relationship I have with the experiences where I, I am helping them to be legitimized because I'm convinced they, it's not just to help them integrate their experiences, and that's important in itself, but they, I believe they, they bring something of extraordinary importance to the culture. In other words, they are receiving information from whatever source this phenomenon emanates from that says human beings have to change. We have to open our consciousness. We're, we're acting like, as one of the experiences call it, rednecks in the galaxy bent on destroying not only ourselves but life way beyond ourselves, other species on the planet, and, and, and even causing a, a cosmic ripple in, in the dimensions of our destructiveness. They, they have to change. The experiences have something terribly important to tell us uh, about this, but then those of us that work with them have that job of legitimizing, trying to legitimize what they have to say. Now, um, Veronica, uh, who I've not known very long, in fact, the first time that uh, Veronica and I were ever in a conference together, I spontaneously, I think it was in Palm Springs even, wasn't it? I just pulled her up on the stage and said, come on, Veronica, let's do this together, you know, because I had such a kind of confidence in her as what I've called a, 
a reliable witness. So I'll uh, turn this over to you. And if there's time afterwards, there's some things about the uh, phenomenon that I want to uh, share with you, but we'll see, see how it goes. One of the um, disadvantages for me this time is that I've had time to think about this talk, whereas in Palm Springs it was so spontaneous I didn't, and I hope that won't uh, work against me here. I just want to say something about St. John the Divine also because when I virtually ran away from home, home being England, London, um, in 1972, uh, 29 years ago now, um, I came to New York and my first job here, the first year I was here, um, was at St. John the Divine uh, ch uh, School right next door to this cathedral. Um, so the, the spiral just keeps going round and coming back to the same place but of course it's always a transformed place. Um, I also, before I start my t what I want to say, um, it's, it's very important for me when I teach or, or when I'm speaking that I remind myself um, who is this work in service to. Um, so I would just ask you in relation to yourself also whom does the work serve? The grail question, who, who is our work in service to? Um, I guess it's my feeling that all of us in one form or another have had some kind of encounter experience, otherwise we wouldn't be in this room. Um, and so I would like to just honor those invisible presences that are here with us today. Um, what I'd like to do actually is start with a dream because one of the things that has become increasingly clear to me is that although the encounter experience that I had in 1989, which is now 12 years ago, um, it was not an isolated event. I myself have not had other encounter experiences such as the one that I had as many people do have repeated experiences but the story doesn't stop there and um, what I've noticed is that the link that was made continues in different forms one for me is in my dreams they also happen in other ways too so for example if I have dreams where there are unknown figures I, I do what Jung calls active imagination and I engage the figures and I found that uh, these luminous ones also come through those meditative kinds of experiences. And so the connection continues and the journey continues. So I'd like to start with a dream that I actually had um, on May the 1st, just this month. Uh, and as it turns out, sort of May Day, May Day is a kind of resonance in terms of the content of this dream. I'll just try and talk about the bits that are the part that's relevant. There's an opening scene, but it moves on. It becomes apparent that there is a woman who has had an unusual encounter with a small yet powerful being from another realm who has disclosed some secrets to her concerning the current situation on earth and she's going to tell us what she was told. This being whose form was a bluish glowing light revealed to her that humans are really gods but this knowledge has been too frightening for humans to handle thus far. 
and their terror about this awesome realization has made them, namely us, run away in fear. Our fear has been so profound that the only means of expressing our terror with the power at our disposal has been to create attitudes, technologies and weapons of destruction that have almost succeeded in annihilating the earth. The extent of the devaluing of life on Earth has become so extreme in recent years that there have been interventions made from other realms to help humans take on the responsibility of our divine natures and to try to help us accept our awesome power in the service of the sacred, in harmony with the wholeness of creation, both invisible and manifest in the service of creative effort, not destruction, in loving regard for all being, not fear resulting in expressions of hatred and violence. The dread become fear needs to be transmuted into the awe reserved for the appropriate response to the wondrous beauty of creation. The chaos of our impoverished times in which the tension of the separation between humans and the divine has reached critical proportions has constellated the need for a profound metanoia in the hearts of all of us. On many different levels and in, in a diverse variety of ways, through stones, through sea creatures, visionar visionaries and children, the silent and invisible ones and the active and outspoken, Earth is receiving tremendous aid in shifting its paradigm of reality from an overly constricted view based in fear to one that calls us back to our angelic resonance. And that was the dream. Um, so the, these connections continue. Um, I would like somewhat briefly to recount my encounter experience, being very aware that there are many different kinds of these encounter experiences and um, all I want to say is that this is the way it came to me. Um, and, and then I'd like to say something about the feature of missing time, um, which was something that occurred in my encounter experience, but only two years ago did I venture to see if I could get some sense of what that missing time was about. So, um, what happened in the encounter experience was that I was uh, on a meditation retreat in the Southern California desert, participating in the second part of an ancient mystery school retreat. So I think it's important to acknowledge the context. I'm not trying to say that there was a cause-effect relation, but I'm trying to say that I was in a field phenomenon. I had been um, uh, doing meditation on all the chakras for a, in a fairly intensive setting with a group for 12 days. Um, we'd done many ceremonies and rituals and the conference was over and uh, I was going, living on the East Coast at that time and I was um, going to fly back the next day. And a friend and I s said, well, you know, why don't we go up the mountain over Palm Springs and look at the view below. And um, so the two of us got in the car and we started driving up the mountain. We'd had dinner so with a group of us and it was uh, probably about eight in the evening, something like that. It was still light when we started anyway. So we began to make our way up one of the beautiful mountains surrounding Palm Springs. And um, there were two features about the actual journey up the mountain. One was that it was an incredibly blustery evening. There was a lot of wind, you know, sort of bashing the car. And the other thing was um, that there was a lot of traffic on the road um, up and down. So we got near the top and now it was already dark. And um, so we said, well, let's just get off at this, 
you know, view parking lot thing. And so we um, parked the car and we looked out over the mount, uh, from the mountain down towards the town, the lights below. But it was so cold and windy that we said, well, you know, then let's hang around and we'll go back down. At which point my companion turned back towards the car and um, he, he suddenly noticed this, what seemed like um, a stationary object off the side of the mountain. Um, and it had these circulating colored lights on its underbelly. And that was really only the part that we could see. So I don't really know what the shape of whatever this was, was. But he saw it and he said, so looking at it like this, he said, well, what, um, what do you think that is? And I, so I followed his gaze and I, I, I turned to where he was looking. And um, at that point, uh, an extraordinary thing happened. The whole landscape suddenly shifted into a completely different dimension. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, our feet were still planted on the same geographical spot, but the wind completely disappeared and the entire traffic completely disappeared. Um, what happened was the landscape became illumined by a sort of moon, if I were to give it, a, try to describe it, it was a kind of moonscape, as if a light from whose source you didn't know illuminated the land that we were on. But as I say, there was, it was moved into a profound kind of stillness and um, the wind and traffic were no longer present. I've attempted to write about this experience in, in my book, Eros and Chaos, that just came out this month. And um, it's, it's almost impossible to do it, but I, I tried to write about it in the, in the first person to, as much as possible, evoke uh, the emotional experience as, as well as the experience as a, as a kind of factual event. I guess the closest that I could say about it is that it became an experience which unfortunately it's very hard to see in the slide that I wanted to have up here which is the pilgrim discovering another world. In the slide the pilgrim with his or her feet and most of his or her body planted firmly in this world peeks through the hole into eternity it's called or actually in alchemy it's called the fenestra eternitatis the window onto eternity um, and so that in in this world you see the sun the stars and all you know creation but the pilgrim as if goes through the veil into another world that is constructed of, of, of different vibrations. That's the only way I know how to explain it. Um, and in, in the slide, actually, there's some very, very interesting features. There's, there's this double wheel, which is called the double wheel of Ezekiel. And there are also some suggestions. I've had um, a physician actually first noted this to me. There, there's some jagged lines on the... Um, uh, on, this, on the picture that suggests, it's a woodcut, that suggests someone who's just had a heart attack. Um, and so there are two features that this ancient image was very consonant with my own experience. One is in the double wheels of Ezekiel, there is this union of the timeless with the time bound. And that's one way that I can only describe that ex experience. It was as, I was as if fully knowledgeable of my own presence, but in communion with something that was eternal and transcendent. 
Um, the other feeling was one of um, a kind of benign, compassionate, loving presence. Um, I think we are being called increasingly to the center that is the heart. Um, I don't know how long that event took. When I say to people I don't know, I can only say it seemed like about two minutes, even that may be longer than it was. But um, when that window, whatever it was, closed, um, the, the wind came back with full force and the traffic was again on the road, going up and down the road. It, it was, an, it was a, 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 an extraordinarily awesome experience, that's the only way I know how to say it. We got back in the car and we drove down and back to the house um, that we were guests in and um, two things about that. One, it was everybody was in bed and asleep. It was two o'clock in the morning. I didn't realize that at the time. It was actually only later that I suddenly realized well, what happened between about nine and two. Um, the other thing was that when I went into the bathroom, I was looked in the mirror, I had like radiating off a rainbow kind of aura radiating off my form. Uh, when I went back to the East Coast, I, I did tell two couple of people about this experience. I'm sorry to say that I'm, I've been a Jungian therapist for about 20 years and um, have worked a lot with dreams. Um, it's, it's almost impossible. I hope I'm not offending anybody here. I'm sure there are exceptions, but um, what was sad to me was that this experience could not be valued for the actual ontological reality that it had. In other words, if I'd reported this experience as a dream, it would have been much more acceptable. Because with dreams, particularly in the Jungian tradition, you, you appreciate dreams for their symbolic, as if, resonance. And, um, but, but it's as if it's not okay to have a really real experience, even though these experiences are not of the ordinary world. Um, nevertheless, they're not interior experiences. It's not something that's happening inside. It is actually a movement to a new outside, but the outside is not that of ordinary reality. Um, there are, of course, people, and this is what I've done since this experience, that have, throughout history, known about these states of consciousness and that's what I'm currently doing research on because like John I feel that there is a kind of perennial ancient mystic gnostic alchemical gnosis that um, before our time our time being the last four or five hundred years um, knew these states of being and highly valued them for example in the Sufi tradition, it's called the Mundus Imaginalis, a third ontological realm between pure spirit and the sensory world. And um, in alchemy, of course, it's, it has other names too, the Imaginatio Vera, it's, uh, and that was distinguished from fantasy. It's a, it's, it was a world that was in between matter and spirit, a subtle body realm. And uh, it's my experience that these worlds are constructed of um, but when I did the recovery of missing time, there were several features about that, that world that I entered that I didn't remember for 10 years. One is that they are constructed by unconditional cosmic compassion. And um, the other is that they have their landscapes of tremendous beauty, beauty being also a value that we have lost, I think, in our time. Um, and they, they carry enormous emotional and healing powers. Um, and this is what I think is being recovered in our time. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, just uh, say a couple of other things, and then uh, we're going to have time for some questions and discussion. Uh, I should have mentioned that uh, Veronica Goodchild is a professor of psychology at Pacifica uh, in near Santa Barbara in California, and uh, I sometimes wonder, I never asked her this, whether you get in any of the same sorts of difficulties uh, out there. Is it a more tolerant culture than in the East Coast? I'm left to learn to do what I like to do. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention something that's coming up in my work now, which uh, is a sort of frontier edge. Uh, I'm reading about and seeing in my work people that are having experiences with uh, so-called reptilian beings. And these experiences vary from sexual encounters to violent encounters, even to uh, uh, be, uh, people being devoured by these beings. But whatever the experiences are, they are powerful and they are primal. And it occurred to me while I was thinking about this, uh, uh, the original or first epic in the English language was Beowulf. And what Beowulf is about, if you recall, is the heroic figure there wrestles with a dragon by the name of Grendel, and later with his mother, which uh, hardly needs interpreting, and uh, who he drowns uh, in the water. The, the son, Grendel, he just crunches and crushes in a great battle. It made me think what connection there might be, and this is speculative, I probably wouldn't do this any place but, but here, but I, uh, what connection is there with the fa fact that our first epic is a battle between a reptilian dragon being uh, and a heroic human? And to me those battles are very similar to what I hear about in the whole reptilian struggle uh, of some of the uh, abduction experiences. I think we just, yeah. Um, and so I thought two things about this. One is there's some aspect of our own primal reptilian phylogenetically carried nature that we have not come to terms with. And right in that first epic, we're projecting it outside of ourselves and then destroying it. So there's a sort of a more somewhat standard return of the repressed phenomenon there to be integrated and dealt with. But there's another, pro that doesn't quite do it. I mean, that's important and that's part of it. But the other part of it is that these beings are not simply projections. In other words, we have this uh, anthropocentric notion coming down through psychology and psychiatry that uh, these mythic entities are simply projections of our own unconscious, mythic or otherwise. And we don't credit the fact that the universe may actually contain beings of this kind that reach us from another dimension. That's more disturbing uh, to our worldview. So I, but I, I think the, the, the last thing about that that uh, came up just a few days ago when I was working with a a woman who was having reptilian encounters that were, for her, were highly negative, involving the devouring of babies and terrible filth and terror. And, and then she said something at the end of the session, because she became much calmer as she integrated some very disturbing experiences. She said, do you think that if we put out negative energy, it attracts negative experiences? And that fit her very well, because she was a person full, full of anger, trying to move beyond anger. And that doesn't mean this, again, was a projection of her own psyche. But in some way, the, the relationship, the connection of, in consciousness between her and whatever was coming to her made sense. In other words, it was the kind of experiences that you would expect. I, think, I see Veronica as somebody who would be more likely to be having experiences of love and enlightenment uh, from from uh, of a different kind and I think that may be related this is just speculative of of the energy that that she puts out I noticed Stan Groff uh, 
uh, came here and is here. And I, I want to acknowledge Stan. Uh, I, I always acknowledge this with a little bit of mixed feelings when I... Uh, um, uh, uh, on the one hand, I'm, I'm deeply grateful to him because I learned about non-ordinary experiences uh, as I'd never had before in, in doing the training with him and working with him over the years. The, the slight sort of downward slope on this uh, uh, is that uh, he got me into this work with the uh, uh, abduction phenomenon because in the middle of the training, for reasons I've really never asked him why he did this, he handed me a paper uh, in a book on spiritual emergencies, which was about the UFO encounter phenomenon. And I kept asking myself after I read it, okay, this is a kind of a Jungian interpretation of it, and I kept asking myself, yeah, but is it really happening? Is it real? And within a few months, I began to see cases and sort of totally changed my life. And uh, so, um, for good or ill, Anyway, um, thank you in a way, Stan. Uh, so, um, so um, I think that's all I want to say. Let's. Do we have time? How long do we have, Cody? Where is Cody? Do we have till what? One twenty, one thirty, something like that. What? Two thirty, rather? Yeah. Okay. Um, so why don't we open it up for uh, discussion? Uh, with you and uh, to e either Veronica or, or to me. Why don't you? And is there somebody that can identify um, the people? Because I can't see a thing. Yes, I know there. you can't. We're, we've got two mics on each side of the room. We'll alternate the questions. If people will come up to either Marlis or Teresa myself, they can ask their questions of you. Uh, one thing, too, we would really uh, enjoy it if you would restrict your uh, strict your statements to questions instead of statements, uh, we would appreciate it. I can't hear the, 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 the sound of it. Can you hear it? Uh, Dr. Mack, have you made any comparisons between the contactee experiences and those, the ever increasing number of those that claim to be the victim of some kind of mind control technology? Uh, you're saying the relationship between the contactee experiences and victims of mind control? Is that? That's correct. Well, that, that's another frontier in this field. Um, somebody did a, a study in McCarthy uh, uh, in, uh, in New Jersey that something like 40% of people that are reporting mind control experiments when they're studied in greater depth are abduction abductees. And there is a, a whole complex of phenomena which seem to be interrelated, which uh, is a kind of dark frontier uh, uh, in, in this. By the way, speaking of dark frontiers, did you happen to notice the cartoon in the latest Newsweek which uh, shows um, Darth Vader figure tapping uh, uh, Mr. Rumsfeld, Secretary of uh, Defense Rumsfeld, looms over him, this dark, tapping him, and he's saying to him, I am your father. <laughs> the latest Newsweek, I mean, they're catching on out there, you know. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the whole militarization of space deserves some discussion in terms of the dark energies. And, and, and um, so you take the military abduction. Some people, this is a very controversial area, some people report that aliens and they've seen aliens and military people working together in underground bases. Um, other people report the NSA is doing all kinds of mind control experiments on the abductees or they meet the abductees when they come out of the, uh, out of the uh, ships and there they are. I, I tend, and this may be <laughs> related to the, the, the uh, non-ordinary state work I've done, but I tend to see this not necessarily entirely literally, uh, more as a some kind of archetypal expression of the shadow side uh, uh, of our, our whole being, where the, the whole military complex represents that shadow and is emergent with the abduction phenomenon in some way. Not that, the, not that there isn't a lot of destructive stuff going on, but when it's connected with the abduction phenomenon, I tend not to take it entirely literally, but I don't know. Uh, so it's a, it's a very, 
it's a scary area. I mean, it's a, I've stayed away from it in some ways. I mean, it's an area where people have done this research, have gotten into, you know, disappeared mysteriously or, uh, uh, you know, gotten, what, I don't know. I, I don't even want to. It's a, a very disturbing subject. Thank you. Um, Veronica, uh, I'm curious as I'm here. <laughs> sorry, Light's I'm terrible. I'm sorry. I'm curious, your companion that night, you said you were with someone when you had that experience. Yes. What was your companion's experience? Um, well, we both experienced uh, the phenomenon of the landscape shifting, the light shifting, the wind, the traffic disappearing, and the um, uh, the pathway that was opened up between where we were standing and the object um, in the sky. Um, we talked on the phone from time to time about this experience because it was so unlike anything either of us had experienced. Um, when I did the recovery of missing time, uh, all I can say is that I'm not, I don't claim that what came through when I try, when I did go to recover that period of time, that uh, that it should be taken literally. All I can say is that what happened was so beyond anything that I could have anticipated would occur um, that he did not accompany me onto the, for want of a better word, uh, vessel or, or ship. So I don't know about that part of it for him. And I think it was actually rather terrifying for him. And, um, he didn't really want to go into it anymore. Um, so I think the uh, content of that part was, was probably very different. I'm sorry, I can't look at you because I can't see where you're standing. I don't know whether I'm even within range. Okay, that's better. You got it. Okay. Yeah. I, I did want to say just very briefly about this dark aspect. I think if you look at all the religious traditions of the world, and the Gnostic and mystical traditions, the, the, the element of the dark night of the soul or the black sun, uh, the, the, there are these connections between the dark and the light in all mystical traditions. And that is part of any analysis. It's part of a spiritual journey. Facing the dark aspects are um, extremely important for the development of self-knowledge and the journey to the divine. And I think that's become part of also the UFO experience. Uh, Dr. Mack, we do apologize for the lights. They are necessary for the video and uh, videotaping. We have another questioner here. No, I couldn't hear either. I can't hear. What? Is somebody, we need a translator in between. It's, it comes out kind of muffled. It's very hard to hear the, the mic. I'll try to speak loudly. Uh, Dr. Mack, in your experience of using past life regression with people, how far back have you taken them and how far back have people had reptilian experiences? It's two questions. Uh, as to how far back have I, uh, as I, if I heard it correctly, uh, had people go back into past life experiences and how about how far back the reptilian experiences um, the I don't take people into past life regression experience they just happen but you have to ask the question in other words somebody's in a relaxation session I don't use, even use the word hypnosis because of all the baggage it has you, somebody puts their head back and relaxes and <laughs> they go into a trance I don't even call that trance anymore because I think what we call normal reality is the real trance now. So, uh, but the, they'll say something like, oh God, I'm here again. That means they've been born, right? Now, I can ignore that and say, what's it like being here again? And, or I can say, well, again? 
what, what do you mean? And then they'll say, go into a, a past life experiences. But it's not like I go back, 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 back. Uh, one woman uh, I worked with uh, uh, immediately associated to an experience which occurred uh, when she was in ancient India. Uh, some must have been uh, 5,000 years ago where she was born into a very poor family and uh, was present at the, her, her soul was present at the moment of conception and uh, this was where on her soul's journey she needed to be was in to be in this most primitive humiliating humiliating the sense of simple kind of uh, unpretentious life and uh, it does seem that abduction experiences or maybe it's just because my own having gone that route I'm open to anything, so I get to hear about past life experiences. It may not be that they are particularly, uh, that, that abductees are particularly prone to that, although it does seem that they are open to non-ordinary states of consciousness by their experiences, and then they readily recall uh, past life experiences. The furthest back was a, a man that uh, I wrote about in the first uh, my first book on abduction, who actually found himself back in the time of the dinosaurs. And again, this reptilian consciousness, which kept knocking on my door, began then, but I didn't think much about it. And now I, now it's become something that I think about and hear about a lot. And I think it's related to what Veronica was saying about the shadow side or the dark side of our natures, the unintegrated reptilian. I don't want to give reptiles a bad <laughs> rap here. It's, it's something more to do with the, the most primal parts of our, of our inner being that uh, we haven't come to terms with in, in our socialization uh, process. Dr. Mack, on your left side of the stage, we have another question. Dr. Mack, you mentioned earlier about Beowulf and dragons. I can't. Is it possible that many of our ancient folk tales and fairy tales are actually based on true experiences of people having such experiences with reptilian figures or um, visiting other worlds, other realities, opening a magical door, going into another reality, then returning to this world with new enlightenment, even something as recent as Alice in Wonderland. Did you get that? Uh, um, this is stories, perhaps actual reflections of these kinds of experiences, fairy tales, myths yeah. and stories. You know, I think that's a, a, a wonderful question. I, 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 I don't know the answer. I, I think there's some kind of, of energetic or connected systemic relationship between the, these creatures, monsters, reptiles, whatever, that appear in fairy tales and myths that are both part of our psyches but also have some kind of ontological validity outside of, of ourselves and that uh, we have yet to to integrate and I I mean for example the the whole Godzilla type um, series of, of uh, movies which began in Japan interestingly after the um, atomic bomb uh, went off and uh, these creatures presumably were originally kind of mutations that, that uh, turned reptilian monsters after what we did uh, in using the uh, atomic bomb similarly we have all these uh, very popular monster alien uh, movies which are kind of these horrible reptilian like creatures with, with sticky bodies and tails and this, this is part of our whole world that we have not really uh, we're scared of it but we haven't seen it as something of ourselves and so uh, I think it's very much related to the violence we, we perpetrate by not uh, owning this and coming to terms with this dimension of ourselves Dr. Mack question on your right. It's clear from your work and others that people are having alien abduction experiences. In current times people have experiences with things that look like flying saucers. In the previous century people had experiences of things with things that looked like dirigibles before there were dirigibles. I'd like to ask you whether you believe these experiences are endogenous coming out of the person's subconscious processes or whether the aliens they're experiencing are independent creatures with their own alien agenda independent of us or something entirely different? Well the simplest answer is both. 
Um, I, I believe that they have an ontological status which we don't understand, which is in part archetypal and a reflection of our own unconscious in the way uh, Jung talked about it. I also believe uh, in the sense of William James that there is a true provoker here, that there is a physical reality that comes to us from outside that there are. And this has to do, I think, with what uh, Richard Tarnas and Stan and others have, have uh, written about, that we have systematically in our anthropocentric humanism voided the cosmos of all intelligence other than that which is a projection of our own minds. And that is a catastrophe in itself and has left us, as Rick Tarnas says, in a, in a terrible state of mourning and grief because we have, in that process, completely rid the universe not only of all intelligence and beings but of, of, of God itself. So here we are completely alone and uh, unrelated beyond our, our immediate material circumstances. Um, maybe, maybe one more and then I, I just had a question. couple of concluding things I wanted to say. Dr. Mack, the last question then on your right hand side, uh, on your left, I'm sorry. Dr. Mack, I'm sorry I came a bit late, but I wanted to ask, what do you think is the most important reason that the field of psychiatry and psychology and the world at large ought to listen or might listen to what you have experienced? What's What's the most important reason why? All right, well, that leads into what I wanted to conclude with. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, Professor Nasser, Syed Nasser, and what his, in several of the books of his I read, the thesis is that by restricting our consciousness, our epistemology, to the material world, to cutting ourselves off from the divine, we have thereby allowed ourselves to become this destructive agent in the cosmos, this, what I mentioned, this, um, these rednecks in, in the universe, and that the, we're not accountable. We're not accountable to any kind of spiritual hierarchy. Uh, and it seems to me the most important thing about these experiences, and my thoughts about this, I like the question, of it, but it keeps evolving. Right now, I think that the most important aspect of it is if we can legitimize the experiences of people like Veronica, the most important aspect of it is that we are learning something, we are being told something, we are being given vital information about what we're doing to the earth, about what we're doing to ourselves, to one another, and that it's a, a wake up. Uh, it's it's a, an attempt to, to wake us up. And we are aware of this trance. Uh, I live uh, with an eight-year-old child, so I get to see a lot of children's movies that I wouldn't probably otherwise go to see. So I went to see uh, uh, with him uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle. And uh, how many of you have seen it, uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle? Anyone at all? I can't, doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, what that's about is that uh, this fearless leader, this bad guy, well, he was actually in the TV series in the 60s, is kind of a Nazi-like character called Fearless Leader, and he's got two Russian accomplices. And he's taking over the country and presumably the world eventually through RBTV. Now, RBTV is really bad television. And what he does is he broadcasts nonstop these soporific programs, this uh, sort of sterile marketing of him and, and all the empty products and the uh, meaningless stuff, which, of course, is very much like what we're getting for real, you know, now. And... Uh, and everybody's kind of, you know, like zombies, you know. They don't know what to do, and they're going to vote for him and make him president. And so um, Bullwinkle, using the latest technology, gets sent by email uh, into the studio and emerges from a fax machine just in time to break up the television equipment. And as he does so uh, and blows up the television equipment, uh, they can't hear fearless leaders voices voice anymore and they all begin to wake up from the trance you see them on the right in the movie and then they begin to think for themselves you know? so somehow i see this phenomenon as like that it was a wake up trying to get through to us uh, we're very uh, we're cut off through this rbtv and the like from our relationship with the divine with spirit and it to get to us because we are so cut off it has to get to us 
in a form we can recognize. And this is why we pay it. We don't pay attention to esoteric religion or the Kabbalah or all the uh, uh, Sufi uh, truth or even Syed Nasir's uh, incredibly eloquent words because we are not engaged in the practice of knowing the divine. So it has to get, take a form we can recognize, you know, UFOs and spaceships and this kind of thing. And I, uh, not that they're not real, and they've been around for centuries. There's pictures from the Renaissance which shows UFOs in Renaissance paintings and perhaps, but it's hard to interpret some of these things. But it's now that phenomena like this are coming to us as if a, a kind of return of the repressed from the cosmos to the spiritually impaired. It's a, it's a crashing through and I, I, I think that the experiencers uh, are rec receiving this information just in there, like in this way that is so profoundly transformative as Veronica was, was talking about. And I think that's the most important aspect of it. And, but, or and, and this is the thing I, I wanted to say, really emphasize and, and, and close with, is that uh, we have work to do in developing a reliable epistemology, methodology, science, whatever you want to call it, a way of knowing because knowing was originally a sacred act for knowing the divine. It wasn't just about breaking up pieces of the material world and then studying them in isolation. Knowing was about opening consciousness, soul, to who we were in, in a much larger sense. And, and we've lost that. So uh, in a way, what I think this is helping us to do, has forced me to do, is to work on uh, developing a sacred science or an epistemology of the divine or whatever you it would be uh, so we can begin to legitimate this kind of, of report, uh, which, you know, it tends to get rejected and ridiculed for all kinds of reasons, because it is threatening and all the reasons you, you know. But there is also the valid critique, which is that we haven't developed a, a reliable, systematic way of knowing and understanding uh, these realms from which we have so um, se uh, separated ourselves. Thank you very much.